Hello, I'm Calvin Perry, and I'm the superintendent here at the University of Georgia's Stripland Irrigation Research Park. We're a research and education center in the College of Ag and Environmental Sciences here in Mitchell County in deep southwest Georgia. I'd like to welcome you to this year's Stripland Park Virtual Field Day. At today's field day, you will hear from a number of scientists, graduate students, researchers, extension specialists, and extension agents as they present the overview of their projects that we are hosting for them here at the Stripland Park. Our mission is really to help growers be as efficient as they can be when they irrigate. So many of the projects you'll hear about today certainly address that issue and leads to what I like to call more crop per drop. Some of our other projects involved other aspects of irrigated agriculture, including fertigation, chemigation, disease management, and fertility management. So as you view these presentations from my colleagues that are presenting at our virtual field day, I hope you will pick up some tips, some information that will be valuable to you. I hope you'll see some of the tools, techniques, and technologies that the University of Georgia College of Ag and Environmental Sciences are developing and testing and researching here at the Stripland Park. And now as we approach the end of my introduction, I'd like to just offer uh, the ability for you to submit questions at the end of this presentation. You'll see our contact info. So feel free to send us your questions, your comments, your uh, any info you would like us to address, and I'll be sure to get it to the right speaker. So again, thanks for joining us, and we hope you enjoy our virtual field day. So hello, I'm Nick Place, Dean and Director of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. Established in 1859, that the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences has been a source of innovation for the last 162 years. What started as a Georgia State College of Agriculture that taught forestry, veterinary medicine, animal husbandry, and home economics has grown into a robust learning environment that includes opportunities to study in fields such as food science and technology, poultry science, environmental re resource sciences, and applied biotechnology. In addition to our goal of educating the next generation of professionals in agricultural and environmental sciences, our college seeks to lead the way in innovative, cutting-edge research efforts. Furthermore, we translate that research into learning resources for our communities through our Cooperative Extension Service. To support these efforts, the Stripling Irrigation Research Park was created to provide an outdoor laboratory for scientists and extension specialists to develop, test, and demonstrate innovative tools, techniques, and technologies to address irrigation-related water issues here in Georgia. As a state in the humid southeast, Georgia typically has abundant water resources, both as surface and groundwater. However, we do have many other water, uh, pressing water concerns. Some include the rapid population growth in Metro Atlanta, episodic droughts that require targeted irrigation efforts, and water use struggles with neighboring states over water quality and quantity. A number of our college faculty, specialists, and agents are involved in various aspects of water included water quality, water quantity, and water policy. These issues cover a wide range of settings from urban to rural and from the mountains to the coast. We're glad that you're able to join us today to learn from our experts who are connected to our work here at Stripling and we're thankful for all the hard work accomplished here and I hope that you're able to benefit from this opportunity to hear from the scientists behind this critical research. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alan Moore. I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, commonly known as the College of Ag, but you know, we're just as proud of the second half of our name, Environmental Sciences. I'm here to welcome you to the Stripling Irrigation Park uh, Field Day, uh, and welcome you to come and see some of the research that goes on at Stripling. Now, all of our research and education centers are spread across the state, and that gives us the opportunity to address issues in different areas of the state, different soil types, different uh, rainfall, weather types, uh, seasonality. Um, and Stripling though, and like all the recs though, they each have a, a unique flavor. And Stripling's unique flavor is water. Um, you know, 
it's very important that we conserve, even though it seems like in Georgia we have as much water as we'll ever need, it's not always where you need it, when you need it, or how much you need at the time. And what Stripling does, and the research that goes on at, at Stripling, is help find that balance and optimize the use of water in agricultural systems. You know, I was an undergraduate at Arizona State University back in a previous century, so it was some time ago. Uh, I, I worked during the day and I went to school at night as much as I could. Uh, and I used to go on campus at night and I noticed that they'd flood the campus at night. All of the grassy areas were actually just a pond. Now, there was a reason for that. It's Arizona State University and therefore there's pretty high heat and very large evaporation. And so they were flooding at night in order to water the grounds without as much evaporation occurring. But it occurred to me that maybe while they got the timing right, the where and the how much might have been wrong. And so you see we've come a long way since then. We realize you can't just throw water out and hope that it gets to where it needs. In fact, different spots need different amounts of water. Different soil types need different amounts of water. And we can use the science that we have in order to know where and when that water is going to be most valuable. Here at Stripling, we bring together engineers row crop scientists, pathologists, entomologists, soil scientists, and together they can bring their expertise and optimize uh, the use of water to grow the most crop per drop, as Calvin likes to say. So enjoy your time in listening to the different presentations from our scientists. I know you'll learn a lot. I've always learned a lot from listening to what they have to tell me. Uh, I find Stripling to be one of those really fun places to go. Uh, because it has such a, a perfect focus on that environmental side, that sustainability side of the College of Agriculture. So thank you very much for your attendance and enjoy. Welcome to the Stripling Irrigation Park Field Day. This facility is one of eight research centers that are located throughout the state of Georgia. In fact, Stripling Park is our newest addition to the system. This facility came about in 2002 due to the generous donation of 130 acres by the CM Stripling family. Mr. Stripling was a pioneer at the start of modern irrigation farming in Georgia, and his desire to develop and improve this technology continues to drive much of the research that's conducted at this facility. The staff is fortunate in having cutting edge technologies available to carry out the mission of the park, including variable rate irrigation, and advanced irrigation scheduling technologies that include the use of soil moisture sensors, smart irrigation apps, and drones. This technology is changing rapidly and Stripling Park is a proving grounds for evaluating these new tools. And one of the main reasons to attend this field day is so you can see what new devices are being developed and tested. This year there are 13 experiments, eight of which have irrigation as a main effect in their treatment scheme. Of course, irrigation is just one piece of the puzzle and crop response to irrigation depends on many other factors like variety and soil fertility. These inputs interact with irrigation to contribute to yield and profitability and many of the experiments look at these interacting factors. Of course, you can optimize irrigation, variety selection, and soil fertility, but if you don't keep on top of insects and disease issues, you won't see much benefit from your other inputs. So this year there are studies that address important local pest issues as well. With so many inputs to consider and all the interacting factors, most studies must be repeated for several years to develop enough data to make informed, reliable recommendations. So several experiments are repeats from last year. Stripling Park may focus on irrigation technology, but there's a wide variety of experiments looking at different crop inputs and commodities with research conducted by faculty from a range of disciplines. I hope that you'll find the information helpful and that it can be applied to your operation to make your life a little easier and more profitable. Hello, I'm Brian Hayes. I am the County Extension Agent here in Mitchell County. And today I'd like to talk to you about a little plot that we're doing here at Stripling Irrigation Park. Um, a little introduction, uh, history behind it. Um, Mitchell County grows 50 to 60,000 acres of, co of cotton every year. 
Um, and as growers increase their cotton acres, it takes longer and longer to plant. So they're pushing that planting window longer and longer into the season. While the insurance cutoff is June 15th for growing cotton, a lot of growers, you know, are still have many acres to grow at that time. And we know historically that their yields drop, you know, the further into the year we go. Um, ideal planting time is, you know, in May, middle of May. Um, but as we grow sweet corn and we try to double crop cotton behind sweet corn, we really push that envelope. Um, it's not unusual for growers to be planting cotton around here a few acres, still 4th of July. Um, so what we've done here is we've set up a planting date study um, where we came in here in uh, the middle of May, the 1st of June, the middle of June, and then the 1st of July we have planted Delta Pine 2038, it's a very common variety around here. It's not the fullest season, but it's not an early season. It's just a good variety that many growers plant. And we planted it in four different dates, and we're going to take the yield um, each date so we can show these growers that, hey, you know, the 1st of July is really too late to be planting cotton here. You know, you can go into, you know, June, um, you know, what type of yield do you, will you lose if you're planting on June 15th instead of, June 1st, you know, once, you know, how much yield are we losing in June versus our prime planting month of May? So that's uh, what we're doing here. As you can see in the back, we've got the oldest cotton is already up good. Looks like a lot of cotton around. Um, the cotton on further past was our second planting. It's coming up good. It's good. The cotton right here that I'm standing in right in front of was planted a week and a half ago. So it's just up good now. And behind that biggest cotton, I don't know if you can really see it now, but it's an unplanted check. We'll actually plant it here in the next couple of days, and that'll be our final planting. Um, on, on top of this study, um, or to kind of complement this study, what we're going to do this fall from across the county agents across the state is we'll go out there and flag white blooms through the month of September. Um, and then as we'll, we'll flag those blooms once a week and we'll harvest them and take weight so we can also take the results from this plot, correlate them to what it does across the state, hopefully. Um, so just a little thing we're doing, you know, they had a little extra few rows here, it's the irrigation park um, this year, and they said, you know, hey, if you want to do something, this is what needed to be done. So this is what I'm, I'm thankful that Calvin Perry and the staff here allowed us to, to plant a few, a few rows of cotton to do this. So I'm Glenn Harris, University of Georgia, based in Tifton. I'm a soil fertility specialist, and I've been in Tifton for 27 years, working on corn, cotton, peanut, and, and, and uh, soybean fertility. And I've done a number of research here at the, uh, research projects here at the uh, Stripling Irrigation Park over the years. Uh, we've done some cotton work where we looked at potassium on cotton, especially uh, split applications of, of potassium on cotton, believe it or not. Even on these deep sands, uh, we did not see a benefit of splitting K on cotton. And, and that's one of the reasons I, I really um, like doing my research here because it's one of my few sites that is representative of this area where, where production ag is really big on irrigated deep sands. Um, I have research in Tifton and Midville, Adipolis, et cetera. Uh, but this is really a good location for me and I, I usually see some really good results on my soil fertility work. Like I said, we've done potassium on cotton. We also in the past had done calcium on peanuts. Uh, calcium on peanuts is probably the most important fertilizer on peanuts. They fix nitrogen because they're legume, they're good scavengers of things like P and K and uh, calcium and magnesium and sulfur also. Um, so you put a half pound of boron foliar and then it comes all down to calcium. And we've done rate studies before. We've also done timing studies. Uh, actually, as a suggestion from one of the growers in this area, we tried split applications of gypsum on peanuts and found out that that was not necessary, so that was kind of good. Um, we also know we can't put gypsum out real early on a peanut because it will leach out. Uh, you got to put it at bloom time, uh, which is, is what we're doing right now uh, down here today. So um, what we're doing this year, what we're focusing on is actually a, a rate study, just a, a, a calcium rate study on peanut. We're using gypsum, also known as lamb plaster. Chemically, it's calcium sulfate. I have some in my hand here. 
Um, this is the, the form we're commonly using now. It's actually what they call a smokestack or synthetic gypsum. It's from where they scrub the sulfur out of smokestacks where they burn coal at power plants. But we're doing a, a rate study and you're thinking, why, ha why haven't we done rate studies before? Why is that important? And we've actually, in the past, we did, when we switched from, from a small seeded peanut to a large seeded, we did rate studies of 500, 1,000, 1,500 pounds of gypsum and zero. And one of the reasons is our recommendation at UGA is 1,000 pounds. It's kind of an all or nothing. If you need it, you put 1,000 pounds. Well, I found out last year that some of the private labs are actually recommending anywhere from 300 up to 1,250 pounds. So I thought it'd be a good idea to test that and, and see if, the, if some of these lower rates, and we do have some growers using lower rates than 1,000 when they think, ah, I think I got enough, but I still wanna make sure, kind of an insurance kind of thing. So we have rates as low as 300 up to 1,250. Probably should have put 1,500 in again because we actually saw some yield decreases with 1,500 pounds of gypsum. But that's the reason why we're, we're doing this rate study. We actually have it at a number of locations across the state and we'll see uh, how they come out and maybe we should start recommend a, a little less in some situations like we do with, with, with P and K. Uh, it varies by the levels instead of an all or nothing type response. The other thing that is coming out here out of this research and, and why this is important is because um, if you haven't heard, uh, this synthetic gypsum that we're using right now is, is starting to come in short supply. Last two years, people almost basically panicked, didn't think they'd get any. Uh, it hadn't cut, quite got to that level yet, but it has got people thinking about a lot of things like, first of all, do I really need it? And we have a, we have a, a system where we can take a soil sample in the top three inches, call it the pegging zone, Soon after the peanuts come up, we can tell you whether you need it or not. So we're, we're kind of going back to that more. And uh, another thing it's generated is, is uh, interest in grid sampling and variable rate application of gypsum on peanut. We've never done that before, uh, but if supplies get tight on gypsum, then, then that might be something that helps us. So basically putting it where we need it. Uh, first of all, whether you need it or not, or even on a grid sampling and put it in spots or not. Um, and the last thing I'll talk about is, is the source issue, because if you look at the history, we've always, gypsum's, gypsum's the best way to get calcium to peanut. Limate planting also can work, but you need to have, you know, have to have a pH adjustment, and, and, you, and you can't do it after deep turning. So lime is the next alternative. But believe it or not, there's a number of different calcium sulfate sources out there. There's naturally mined products. The problem with those are usually more expensive and shipping costs are real. Um, a lot of the issues uh, with getting gypsum to South Georgia is, is actually comes down to trucking cost and how far away you are from the source. Um, the flue gas, uh, this synthet synthetic stuff was coming out of Macon or even North Florida. We used to use one called wet bulk. It's a byproduct of the phospho industry and we still can get that. Um, we got away from that because it didn't spread as good and that kind of thing. So we might have to go back to using that more. And we've looked at alternatives on this farm at this research station before, calcium chloride through the pivot and all kinds of different gypsums. But really, um, really this synthetic gypsum is, is, is economical, it spreads pretty well. And uh, you know, when you're putting out a thousand pounds, uh, it, um, you need a good source, a uh, readily available source. So not only are we gonna look at rate, but this is also gonna generate into down the road, I can tell you probably doing uh, source studies of gypsum and we'll be, or calcium and we'll continue to do that here at the Stripling Irrigation Research Park. Hey, I'm Yanis Gallos. I just started my studies in UGA Tifton under the guidance of Dr. Velidis. And two months ago, we started our project on peanut fields and irrigation systems. We use five different methods in this peanut field here. Uh, for scheduling the irrigation, we're using soil moisture sensors, thermometers, and the official checkbook of Dr. Velidis about irrigating those fields. Uh, behind me, you can see two different soil moisture sensors. On, my, on the left, you can see the UGA SSA sensor, which senses uh, soil moisture potential at the levels of 8, 16 and 24 uh, inches depth and on the right you can see the new Centec probes that we use um, which have soil moisture at 4, 8, 12, 16, 20 and 24 inches depth 
and they calculate, they estimate the volumetric water content. So the other two, uh, the other three methods are rain-fed uh, plots, which we don't irrigate at all, and we have temperature, soil temperature irrigation method too, and the fifth one is the checkbook, as I said. So what we're trying to do, our goal here is to uh, transform the already existing uh, software that we have, which is called Irrigator Pro, to a newer version which accepts the volumetric water content sensors, so more growers can, be, uh, can connect their already bought devices to the new software. Our team currently is working on the second object, which is to create an ET version of Irrigator Pro, and hopefully next year we can uh, test it on real fields and calibrate it with other already existed irrigator, irrigation scheduling tools. Our last object would be to have on-farm evaluation and in, co in cooperation with the growers and uh, extension agents, we can check in uh, Georgia, Alabama and maybe North Florida if uh, the latest version of our software will indeed help the growers in their everyday uh, work and in their whole season with peanut fields. Thank you. Hey y'all, I'm Shelby Sankster. I'm a graduate research assistant here at the University of Georgia's Tifton campus. Um, I work with Dr. George Valitas and these are the plots that I get to work in all summer. Um, behind me are 27 cotton plots that we evaluate or we compare between three fertilization techniques and three irrigation scheduling techniques. The three um, fertigation techniques are fertigation, NDVI or normalized different vegetation <laughs> index, and the, um, a traditional approach. Um, each receives different varying amounts of nitrogen. For the fertigation, we actually apply nitrogen side, dress, nitrogen side dressing in three applications. Um, and then for the traditional approach, it is a one 85 pounds of nitrogen per acre application. And for the NDVI, we actually have drones flying out here today uh, to determine um, the normalized different vegetation index so that we can determine how much to apply. Uh, for the three irrigation strat scheduling strategies, we are using the uh, U University of Georgia's checkbook method. Also, we are using the smart irrigation cotton application and the University of Georgia Smart Sensor Array nodes. Uh, for this um, Smart Sensor Array, we call them for short UGA SSA nodes. We have 27, so that's one in every plot. So we've got really you know, local data for each plot for um, determining irrigation scheduling. For the Smart Irrigation Cotton application, it's a phone free phone application that I found to be extremely user friendly. It's uh, using the local weather station data um, and then it also uses uh, cumulative growing degree days to help track growth stage in the plant in the crops. Um, so that's I follow along with that and it tells when to um, to irrigate them. It's, it's fairly simple. Um, and we're, we're finding good results with it. Uh, so it's interesting with fertigation. Um, it it uh, has potential to improve nitrogen use efficiency since it is applied um, over a period of time instead of one application. So it does show great potential and the infrastructure is there in many fields. Um, so we're assessing the feasibility of it um, to see if it's something that should continue. Overall, the goal of this project is to improve nitrogen use efficiency and water use efficiency in Georgia's cotton. Um, so that's what we're working on. We take growth analysis samples. Um, we were out here today taking um, plant tissue samples and soil samples. 
um, and that will continue all season and we'll get some great results from it. Um, so I want to say thank you for joining the virtual field day. Uh, hope to see you all next year in person. <laughs> Well, good morning, and uh, my name is Bob Kimright. I'm an extension specialist at the University of Georgia, professor and extension specialist in the Department of Plant Pathology. It's great to be with you today for the 2021 virtual field day for the Stripling Irrigation and Research Park. I wish we could be together in person. Obviously, we can't this year, but I guarantee you that with uh, Calvin Perry at the helm, we will be meeting in, in the field next year, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, the Stripling Irrigation Research Park is extremely important to my program. It's extremely important to the growers, and I am grateful to be have the opportunity to work there. I'm grateful that the College of Agriculture and Environmental Science at the University of Georgia uh, operates such a facility and makes it possible for me to work there. I would like to go over this morning. If we were in the field, I would tell you in person, but since we're not, I'd like to go over this morning and talk to you about uh, why uh, my work at the Stripling Irrigation Research Park is essential to my program and how that translates into benefits not only for the local community, but the extended community, agricultural community as well, as well as for graduate students. So again, I'm in the Department of Plant Pathology. I know a lot of you. If I don't know you, I look forward to meeting you at some point in the future. And I look forward to sharing with you what we accomplish through Stripling Irrigation Research Park. Why is it essential? Why is it essential? What makes a Stripling Irrigation Research Park different in a lot of ways than from some of the other uh, uh, facilities we have. University of Georgia, CAES has excellent stations around the state. Uh, Midville, I work at a lot. I work a lot at Atapulgas as well. I've worked at Plains a lot. Uh, there's a lot of different stations, but what makes uh, the Stripling Park uh, a little bit different? And uh, they're all important, but what makes this important for my program is that the irrigation capabilities to start off with, the ability to work with irrigation, to vary irrigation, to change irrigation, to study the impact of irrigation and chemigation on disease management and other aspects such as aflatoxin are extremely critical. Uh, the faculty and staff, like at all of our stations, but at the uh, Stripling Irrigation Research Park are very experienced. They're innovative. If there's a problem, they're gonna help me figure out what to do about it. They're willing to do between Calvin and BJ and Kyle and all that are there, they have, a, they have the willingness to work with me and do whatever it takes for success uh, for the visiting faculty, which is not just me, obviously. Uh, the Stripling Irrigation Free Sparks Research Park there in uh, Mitchell County has tremendous disease pressure, whether it's leaf spot on peanuts, white mold on peanuts, Asian soybean rust, Southern corn rust, uh, just to name a few. We have a tremendous amount of, of, of disease pressure there, so it's a great place to study. As you'll see, much of the recommendations we have now are, uh, are for target spot on cotton were developed by our work solely at the Stripling Irrigation Research Park. We have tremendous disease pressure. And then we have close cooperation with our UG extension agents as well, whether it's Mandy working with us, whether it's Calvin working with us, whether it's Kyle, whether it's BJ, whether it's any of those who are there, but we also have the opportunity to work with extension agents in the surrounding areas. Kale Cloud, I see a lot of times up there. I'll see uh, Brian Hayes there from Mitchell County. We have an opportunity to both do trainings there and to cooperate with projects with our county faculty. And for that, I'm grateful. Let's start about what I've got in 2021. Okay, if we were in the field now, it's probably a lot more comfortable than with the gnats and the heat and humidity. I wish we were there, but we're not, but you'll be a little bit more comfortable. Let me just tell you briefly the kind of programs I have that are essential to my work as an extension specialist who also does applied research. What I want to start off with are 2021 corn and soybean sentinel plots. These sentinel plots are funded by the Commodity Commissions for Soybeans and Corn. That's grower money that's used and invested. Uh, we have had soybean sentinel plots for Asian soybean rust at the Stripling Irrigation Research Park since about 2006, 2005, 2006 annually. They has been a linchpin. It has been a, a foundation of our work in the early detection as Asian soybean rust is reintroduced into the state. Since about 2013, 2014, maybe a little bit earlier than that, we've also had sentinel plots there for the reintroduction to detect the early reintroduction of Southern corn rust in the state of Georgia. Now, both of these diseases can be hugely important. Both of these diseases can cause significant yield loss, but they don't always occur uh, 
earlier in the season. Sometimes they occur later in the season. When they arrive, makes it critical as far as in giving recommendations to growers, corn growers and soybean producers in southwest Georgia as far as when to spray or not to spray. We monitor those on a biweekly basis. We have help from the staff at the Stripling Irrigation Research Park to help us to establish these and they're monitored. And you can see at the picture at left, on right rather, you can see this is a current picture and you can see how our monitoring effort in South Georgia has been translated into, this is Southern corn rust. You can see that Southern corn rust is being detected all the way up the Mississippi River Valley into Missouri. And what I'll say is the Sentinel plots first established at uh, in Georgia and at the Stripling Irrigation Research Park for corn rust were the first in the country. You can see how the impact of working at a place, having the opportunity to establish Sentinel plots to establish collaborative research, collaborative extension opportunities has translated into something now on a national scale. This slide's a little bit dated. This is 2014 uh, and 2015, but you can see that we have archived on national websites all the way back to about 2009 and earlier than that for soybean rust, all the way back to about 2006, you can see that we're able to uh, document, we're able to uh, catalog and also provide information on the development and spread of Southern corn rust, and Asian soybean rust in the country uh, on a national, it's of national interest. And again, when did this start? It started in Georgia. What does the Stripling Irrigation Research Park have to do with it? Annually, we have sentinel plots there that we manage, that are helped to manage, and that we look at for these diseases. They provide information not only to our local growers, but they also provide information to our county agents. They provide information on a regional basis and ultimately on a national basis. What happens right here at the Stripling Irrigation Research Park means something on a national basis. 2021, we also have a number of studies out on foliar diseases of cotton. And I think, and I'll say this, that the work we have done at the Stripling Park and the recommendations we have for the management of target spot on cotton would not be possible if we had not been able to work, if we had not had the support, if we had not had the capabilities there in Camilla at the Stripling Park to study target spot. We have other trials from other places, but really a lot of what we've done has been based upon that. 2021, we're going to be looking at foliar diseases of cotton. We got replicated trials assessing the performance of fungicide programs. We have a number of fungicides now available for the management of foliar diseases on cotton. And it's not just target spot anymore. There at the Stripling Park, we're able to not only have some of our best assessments of target spot, but now we have areola mildew. And I would say that in my wheelhouse, in my world, probably one of the most emerging things over the past uh, 10 years, maybe a little bit longer than that, has we've gone from not considering a fungicide application on cotton to now we're looking at a number of different fungicides that are labeled. And so if all of these fungicides are labeled on cotton, the question becomes is how do we make recommendations? How do we make recommendations for what's the best fungicide to use? How do we make recommendations for how often we should use them? How do we make recommendations for when we should time the applications and what we should use? And I can say that without hesitation that the strategies we have in 2021 will help us to continue to expand our arsenal. The studies we have at the research park in 2021 will build upon the foundation that we've already laid based upon work done there over the past a decade looking at uh, the management of target spot and now areola mildew. And again, these recommendations would not be possible if we did not have our work effort there, our research effort. Why? Because we have the kind of conditions we need. We have the kind of irrigation we need. We also have the disease pressure we need at the Stripling Irrigation and Research Park. We're also doing work this year on foliar diseases of corn. And again, why is it so important? Well, uh, looking at southern corn rust, southern corn leaf blight, two very important diseases. I've already told you that we have sentinel plots there every year managing or, or, or looking for the introduction, reintroduction of southern corn rust, but we're also able to get some excellent studies there. So in 2021, we have replicated trials assessing performance of fungicide programs. And again, these are of importance, not only on the local level, the county level, the region level, the state level, but also as a national level as well, because a lot of the data we get from trials like we have at Stripling are useful not only to our growers, but growers outside the state of Georgia. And they also help these chemical companies to assess how the fungicide should be used. In this picture, you can see this Southern corn rust. 
This is a slide I used at a recent uh, silage training that was a UGA extension silage training. This is just one of the slides I showed them. But if you look at the Zyway, the Delaro, the Veltima, and the Triva Pro, if you look on the left, on the right hand side, and you can see the logos for those fungicides, uh, the information that I presented to growers in 2021, uh, silage growers, as far as recommendations, helping out with the silage team, all of those we're completing, or we, we've done that work at Stripling before, and we're continuing that work in 2021 at Stripling. I'll take, for example, the Zyway 3D that you see. That's a novel way of introducing a fungicide. It's an inferro application uh, to provide uh, some level of control throughout the season. Will it work? Won't it work for Georgia? It may work in the Midwest, but for Georgia growers, we're assessing that, working with FMC to assess that. And I could say, that the two trials I've had, I've worked with Zyway two times as small plot trials, and both of them have been at the Stripling Irrigation Research Park, first in 2020, now in 2021. Why is that? They have the capabilities, the equipment to help me with in-furrow applications and the irrigation schemes we need. So it's an excellent opportunity, and it translates not only into research that helps us develop a, pro, uh, develop a fungicide program, but also that helps us in extension efforts as in this silage virtual silage field day held about two weeks ago. One of the most important aspects we're working on this, this year at uh, uh, the Stripling Irrigation Research Park is an irrigation interaction with peanut aflatoxin. Aflatoxin has become a huge issue for peanut producers in Georgia and in the Southeast. It's gained extreme uh, awareness. Growers are very much aware of it. The shelling industry, the peanut industry is aware. They have been aware. They recognize the impact, the negative impact that aflatoxin has on our entire peanut industry. From the growers all the way up to the shellers, to the manufacturers. Aflatoxin is perhaps the biggest threat we have on a national and an international basis as far as peanut production in the state of Georgia. One of the things we know is that aflatoxin is affected by irrigation and rainfall. If you have hot and dry conditions, you have a greater risk for aflatoxin during field, during field season, in field production of aflatoxin. If you're able to cool the soils, if you're able to use effective irrigation, if you have rainfall, then you have less risk to aflatoxin. And so working in conjunction with Dr. Wes Porter and Dr. Chris Bilon, we are sharing in a project this year to see how the, very, the impact of various irrigation scheduling programs have on the potential for aflatoxin. Now, what's exciting about this is the University of Georgia CAES, all the way up to our dean and also our associate deans have taken a true interest in aflatoxin. So this collaborative effort with Dr. Porter and Dr. Pilon allow us to share a multidisciplinary aspect looking at the management of aflatoxin. Excuse me, aflatoxin. The second thing it allows us to do is with the irrigation capabilities, we're able to, in the same trial, we're able to look at the anything from over irrigated to under irrigated to no irrigation at all and see what the impact is. Most important to me for my program is not only developing information to help the growers to help the peanut industry, but also this is part of a master's project for a new graduate student I have, Lakshmi Pandi. And so she's able to be a part of the stripling community and also to, to, to collaborate in this research, but also it's going to take her towards her master's degree. One of the most important projects that began last year with Kale Cloud, who's now a county agent in Grady County, and continuing in 2021 is chemigation for management of peanut diseases. In the past, we've done chemigation work on corn, and at the Stripling Irrigation Park, the work done in the past with another MPPM student has shown that under the right conditions and with the right equipment, chemigation for corn can be just as effective as a, a, any other application. What growers want to know, what we want to know is, can we use chemigation for management of peanut diseases? Uh, this year, we continue on from 2020. Now in 2021, we have replicated trials assessing the impact of chemigation versus traditional spray boom applications for control of leaf spot and white mold, two of the biggest diseases affecting peanut growers. And this work could not be, I can say this, this work could not be done anywhere that I know of as well as we could do it here because we are able to have chemigation uh, and you replicated trials using chemigation. This is an MPPM project for uh, Mr. Casey Harrington. You can see him on the left in the blue check shirt. It's also a project for University of Florida intern who's come to the University of Georgia to do an internship and his internship, a large part of that is at the Stripling Irrigation Research Park looking at chemigation. Uh, 
And the goal is when you look at white mold or southern stem rot, which is a, a major problem we have in Georgia, and fortunately for me, unfortunately for stripling, is they have a significant outbreaks of southern stem rot or white mold, and also leaf spot problems. So the goal we have with this trial, with this information, is to see can we use chemigation to effectively manage these diseases. Now, from 2020, it appears that we cannot get the same level of control of white mold and leaf spot with chemigation that we can with a tractor mounted boom application. Okay, it looks like chemigation is gonna be less effective in peanuts, but there are aspects of white mold control and washing it down that we're gonna to continue to look at and see. And the whole goal is when you look at this collage of fungicides that are available to growers, what we wanna be able to provide to them based upon the research here at Stripling is not only what are the best fungicide programs to use? Not only how do you make heads or tails out of this collage, but also do you have the opportunity as a grower to not only think of aerial application, not only think of tractor application, but also can you use your chemigation, can you use your irrigation equipment? Can you use your center pivot to make uh, fungicide applications and control disease? And the jury is still out on that. But if we want to answer it, there's no better place than stripling. Hello everyone, my name is John Snyder and I'm a crop physiologist here at the University of Georgia. And uh, I'd like to start, before I really dive into my research projects here, I'd like to start by uh, you know, thanking the University of Georgia and thanking the Georgia Cotton Commission for all their support over the years. I've been working here at the university for the last nine years and, um, and I've done a lot of different types of projects in that time uh, related to production agriculture. And what I would like to do, though, is, is really point out that I've done research at farms all over the state, um, but this particular, uh, this particular facility here, since this is the CM Stripling Irrigation Research Park Field Day, I'd really like to focus on the uniqueness of this, of this facility. So, uh, for example, this is really the only research station like it in the entire state. We have the ability to apply different irrigation amounts, and not, not just apply different irrigation amounts, but to randomize where those irrigation amounts are applied and do a real experiment uh, related to irrigation. And what I think is safe to say, in addition to this being the only facility like it um, in the state of Georgia, it's one of, of only maybe a handful in the entire country uh, that can even do this type of research. So I really want to point that out. And so, uh, since my time here at UGA, I've, I've had some sort of research ongoing at this facility for that very reason. Uh, so now what I'd like to do is really get into the research that I'm doing. I have uh, what you're seeing in the background is a particular experiment related to, uh, to cultivars, PGR management, and irrigation management. And I'll come back to this one shortly, but I have another experiment here that's focused on uh, irrigation timing and specifically you know the, the making that determination of when to terminate irrigation and uh, so one of the things that we know is is response to any of these management decisions can be influenced by the maturity of the variety so there's a, a an ongoing research trial at a different location on this farm that's focused on that particular question that we fully anticipate that the timing of irrigation termination will be affected by the maturity of that cultivar. So I hope we can have some valuable information there uh, available in the near future. This trial in particular, this is the second year of this research trial. And um, I want to lay a little bit of background here. The first is that we know that drought limits productivity in cotton. I've had uh, research trials here for, like I say, for quite some time, um, but we've documented as much as 700 pound per acre yield losses as a function of drought, and that's just drought occurring during the first few weeks uh, of flowering. So that's a particularly susceptible time, and we can get substantial yield loss and substantial declines in net returns for the grower. Uh, but the other thing is, if we over-irrigate, in other words, apply more water than we really need, we know that there's one, one consequence there is, let's say we get no yield loss, we get the same yields, but we're applying more water than we need. That is a reduction in water use efficiency and it can cause a decline in net returns. 
but with cotton in particular, we've documented another response here, and we're not the only ones, and that is if you over-irrigate cotton, it'll produce excess vegetative growth, it won't set very many bowls, and as a result, you can actually get yield reductions by over-irrigating cotton, and that's a fairly, uh, uh, it's something that we've documented multiple times in the past. And so um, I would like to kind of go into the next part of my, of, of what this project is about, and that is PGR management. So growers routinely apply picks to cotton to shorten internode um, length and to decrease vegetative growth, okay? And so one of the things that we've, um, that we're interested in is finding out if we can alter PGR management strategy, use maybe a more aggressive PGR management strategy to offset those yield reduc reductions that are sometimes observed with excess irrigation. All right, so that's one objective we hope to address here. The other is that PGR management itself is dependent on cultivar, which if we have a more aggressively growing cultivar, we need a more aggressive management strategy. It depends also on water availability, okay? So in the first year of this trial, one of the things we've seen is that under dry land conditions, we really don't get a response to PGR application, whereas when we, we are under irrigated conditions, we can apply, um, apply PGRs and we get a reduction in growth, we get um, a earlier maturity, okay? Um, so we do get, um, you know, um, measurable responses to PGR application under those conditions. All right, so uh, like I say, this is the second of a, of a, a two-year, second year of a two-year project, and we hope to have uh, uh, more information on this uh, at the end of this year and so hopefully have some good answers for growers as well. Um, and so with that, um, that's all I've got to say, so thank you. Hi, my name is Jeremy Perrier. I'm a PhD student in Dr. David Riley's lab in Tifton, Georgia, UGA campus. And uh, I'm here on the Camilla station and I'm working with white flies. I'm mostly working on insecticide efficacy, trying to manage insecticide resistance. I'm working with four crops, uh, pumpkin, collards, cotton, as well as cowpeas. And I'm doing this replicated on four research station sites. So I'm working with Camilla, Plains, Vidalia, as well as in Tifton, Lang Farm. So the purpose of my research is like I'm managing insecticide resistance. So I'm collect, surveying fields, collecting white flies, and then I'll be running LC50 bioassays with them. And to do this, we use different concentrations of two insecticides, mostly imidacloprid and cyanotranilipril, which is a neonic and a damide respective, respectfully. And I'm just checking to see, are these insecticides still effective? And at what dosages are they still effective? What are the chances of resistance being developed to these insecticides that are commonly used in vegetable as well as cotton production? And just checking them, comparing the crops to see if there's any difference that host plant might have on the efficacy of these insecticides. That is the basis of my research. Thank you very much for listening. Hello, I am Solomon Emisa, a PhD student with the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences, and I'm under, under the supervision of Dr. Henry Sintim. I also want to uh, thank the Georgia Corn Commission for proudly sponsoring this work. So today I'll be look, uh, talking about one of my research studies that has been done at the Stripling Irrigation Research Plot. Um, corn is a high input crop, requiring substantial amount of nutrients and water to produce appreciable yield. Soils in Georgia are highly wetted and have low cationation capacities and as a result are not able to hold nutrient elements. This is coupled with the fact that um, the climatic nature of the soil and the cationation capacity and the highly wetted nature of the soil can cause unexpected yield, um, nutrient stress. This is typically what happened at the beginning of this growing season when there was about six inches of uh, rainfall. This has the potential to leach nutrients from the soil, causing unexpected um, nutrient stress. So the study um, is looking at early nutrient stress that's not applying fertilizer 
to the um, VC stage and then applying fertilizer from there to know how the crop will be able to recover from the early nutrient stress. On the other side of the spectrum, there's also, um, it is a long-standing recommendation that farmers um, do nutrient recommendations, nutrient amendments till the VT stage where no nutrient recommendations uh, are done. It is recommended that even if there's any deficiency, it is done in the um, subsequent year. But it is uh, known in literature that at that VT stage, about 60 per, about 50 um, percent of um, biomass would have been accumulated. That means the plant is still accumulating uh, biomass. Also, um, literature also shows that 70 per, less than 70 percent of nutrient element has been taken taken up by the plant. That is, there's the potential for um, 30 percent of uptake. So uh, the study also looks at um, late fertilizer application that is post VT application to see whether the plant can um, take advantage of the late fertilizer application to produce ap uh, appreciable yield. So these two um, nutrient regimes are under two um, irrigation settling strategies. That is triggering irrigation when um, the moisture content is at 50% full capacity and also triggering irrigation when the moisture content is at 80% for capacity. This um, will be done under subsurface drip irrigation and also under overhead drip irrigation. This is the overhead drip irrigation, uh, overhead irrigation. So with the um, preliminary, pre preliminary studies from last year that was only under subsurface drip irrigation showed that whenever we trigger irrigation um, up to about uh, the top eight inches of the soil was still dry. And then due to the sandy nature of the soil, there's limited capillary rise. So even though there's irrigation, um, a bulk of the soil, uh, the bulk of the roots of the corn is not able to uh, access the, the moisture, which causes um, moisture stress. So this time we are comparing the subsurface drip irrigation to the overhead um, irrigation to see how that is going to impact corn um, yield. And then we we'll also look at the economics of it, which one is more economical. We, we already know that sub, uh, subsurface irrigation is um, economical in terms of water use efficiency. But this time we are comparing it to the overhead to see how that is going to affect um, corn uh, growth and yield. So as can be seen here, we can see that the overhead irrigation is looking better than the subsurface drip irrigation. But this is just the first year of the study. So we'll be looking at, um, we'll be repeating this work next year to see how um, the results will come. And then when the results are available, we'll, we'll make sure to share it with all of you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Henry Sintim. I'm the soil fertility, a soil fertility specialist. I'm based over the of UGA Tifton campus. And actually you just heard from one of my graduate students, Solomon Emesa. I'll be talking to you about um, our cotton trial going down here that is proudly sponsored by the Georgia Cotton Commission. Uh, we cannot um, uh, stop thanking you all for the support that you, give, uh, you provide towards our program. I would also use this opportunity to thank the Georgia Corn Commission for supporting the study that Solomon Amis I just spoke about. So why this cotton study? Over the past few uh, years, uh, or even up until now, we have a nutrient recommendation up until three uh, bales, or 1,500 pounds to the acre cotton length yield. And our study that had been conducted by uh, my uh, Dr. Glenn Harris, uh, who is also a soil fertility specialist at the Tifton campus, showed that um, the nutrient recommendation up to the three bales have a net return on investment, positive return on investment. So that opens up the question, could we shoot for higher yield and still make profit? And to make that happen, fertility is critical. 
critical. Optimum nutrient management is critical. And that is the essence of the study. It's kind of a little bit in line with what um, Mr. Emisa spoke about briefly, but here we are also looking at different nutrient management regime. First of all, we need to understand how the cotton picks up nutrients and how it partitions them into the various tissues. And from there, also, how the, what are some of the best diagnostic methods for cotton? Like when nutrients start sufficient and it starts going out, what is the most uh, sensitive part of the plant to detect nutrient deficiency? And that will help everyone, the growers especially. It will help you to stay informed and know when to take corrective actions. So we are looking at uh, basically three management practice and comparing that to the current standard, which I will call the University of Georgia AES or environment, the service lab recommendation, the recommendation of four, three, uh, three uh, bills. And then we are looking at a different nutrient management routine, regime where we apply only 40% of the recommended nutrient, uh, money, uh, nutrient uh, uh, rates, apply only 40% at the initial phase of planting and we don't make any more application. We, would, we are periodically tailored, pulling tissue samples, looking and partitioning them into the leaves, into the stems, and into the productive tissues. And knowing how the levels in these nutrients and how much has been taken up overall. The next uh, nutrient management regime is where we skip nutrient application up until initiation of squares. And then at that stage, we come back and we make intervention, nutrient intervention, all the way until uh, about the fifth week of bloom. Then the final one is where we refer to as reduced stress nutrient management. We put out 40%, 30% uh, at the initial phase of planting, another 30% during square initiation, and then after uh, between the second and third week of bloom, we put out uh, uh, we put out another 30% uh, 30 and then the last 10% we put out when uh, the pods have started uh, forming, uh, when the, uh, the fruits have started forming. And based on, in that case, we are kind of providing nutrients gradually to the point of uh, as and when the crop needs it. This is the second year of the study. Uh, we, we are really learning a lot compared to uh, corn that Solomon was able to show that there is early uh, stress, as you can see from the aerial images, we can tell from the cotton plots that corn is kind of able to tolerate early nutrient stress. Um, it's able to tolerate early nutrient stress, and, but then late season stress was very, very, uh, caused severe yield loss, severe damage to the crop. To the point that, uh, yeah, and then, and that is putting out just 40% and allowing the nutrient to go through stress. Visual deficiency symptoms occurred, but then we detected it in the tissue way before the deficiency symptoms uh, were observed. And potassium seems to be a very, very key nutrient that will penalize you at a late season. So we are looking forward to the results this year. And as results become available, we're going to share it with you all. So please uh, look forward to the data. I'm also excited about the study. And once again, thank you very much to the Georgia Cotton uh, Commission for sponsoring this study. All right. Thank you all very much. Hello everyone, I'm Henry Sintim and it's me again. This time I'll be talking to you about the uh, peanut study I have ongoing here at the uh, Stripling Irrigation Park. And this study we kind of have a little, it's too objective or too major of focus. Just as we've been talking about in the corn, in the cotton study, trying to understand early nutrient stress and how the nutrients are partitioned, mobilized in the crop. Uh, we are looking at that also in peanuts, and it's critical because like corn is a grass, cotton is a broadleaf, but a non-leguminous crop. Peanut is a broadleaf, but this time it's a leguminous crop. So it really gives us a, a holistic picture about nutrient management in the major rural crops that are cultivated here in Georgia. So again, with this study, we are looking at the standard uh, treatment recommendation. And uh, if, as uh, most growers, you would uh, recognize that 
nutrient recommendation for peanuts is typically just putting out maybe bone if your fertility management over the past years has been good and then later coming back during the pod formation stage to uh, put out uh, uh, some gypsum out there but again under very severe weathered soil um, low nutrient then there will be some nutrient recommendation if you are following the uh, UGA uh, standard of uh, recommend nutrient recommendation for peanut we are looking at that and then we are looking at early nutrient stress and then later come up with uh, the recommended nutrient application just to understand how peanut respond another aspect of the study that we are trying to understand is whether current nutrient sufficiency levels are adequate for peanut so we are coming in pulling uh, the leaf blades uh, periodically and testing for the uh, uh, nutrient levels then we are triggering nutrient application we have two thresholds we have the high threshold and we have low threshold and then we come in and, and make a, a nutrient application to understand it and we have similar study for corn that is ongoing at the uh, at UGA research station in Tifton and we think that this gives us a bigger picture of what is happening how the different crops uh, um, utilize nutrients and also what would be and, and then in based on the results and findings we are able to uh, come up with optimum nutrient management for productive and economic yields in our crop and uh, this is the uh, first year for the adaptive nutrient scheduling aspect of the project and then the last year study we looked at the threshold we realized that indeed as recommended peanut is very uh, it's a marginal crop does not require uh, that substantial amount of nutrients we didn't see substantial differences but again as uh, Mr. Misa mentioned uh, these are all this is being evaluated under subsurface drip uh, irrigation and there is the potential that water could be uh, water stress due to uh, low capillary rise in the field could be a problem. So uh, we don't, we would, we would say this is conclusive. This is conclusive under subsurface drip. We are evaluating it again this year. We would make further evaluation under overhead irrigation and that will give us a very holistic picture. So um, yeah, we are looking forward to the data and as they become available, we will share with you all. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us for the Stripling Virtual Field Day in 2021. I'm Wes Porter, Extension Specialist covering Precision Ag and Irrigation based out of Tifton, Georgia. Today I'm going to talk about the studies that I have here at Stripling Irrigation Research Park. And as you know, being an irrigation specialist, typically most of my research occurs here at this park. Every year I have multiple studies that we're looking at a few different things. This year I've got studies focused in corn, cotton, and peanut, and I'm going to go into in-depth portions of each one of those studies with you and talk about them um, throughout this talk. So first, we're going to talk about the corn study. It was planted back in March. Um, we've just kind of reached peak tassel and, and moved past that and we're actually moving out of peak water use uh, right now and by the time you see this video, we're definitely going to be out of peak water use and starting to kind of hit that dent and dry down phase when we're looking in later July. But what we've looked at in that study, we actually have nine different treatments in that field. We're monitoring each one of those treatments with sensors and at least two plots of each, uh, each treatment. And we're looking at utilizing watermark soil moisture sensors to monitor soil moisture continually every hour in that study. And so we've got sensors installed again in, in two, two plots of each treatment. And in each one of those nodes, those sensor locations, we actually have three depths. So we're eight, 16 and 24 inches deep. So when we start talking about corn, I, I kind of choose those depths just because we look at the rooting depth, water use, and all of corn, that's where we like, would like to place those. And you'll see as we talk about the other crops, sensor depths may change a little bit to reflect where the root depths are at. And so we're looking at three treatments that reflect utilizing that soil water tension data from those sensors. We've got a 10 kilopascal treatment, which I consider is very wet. Um, to be honest with you, we end up irrigating that treatment almost every day. And so that's definitely overwatering that crop. Um, we repeated this study from last year, and so we'll talk about some of the results from last year and how and what we're seeing this year after, after I tell you all the treatments. The second treatment is 50 kilopascals, and so that's getting on the edge of dry. And so for corn especially, 
we're looking at that. So that may not be enough water sometimes, but if we're looking at cotton and peanuts, a 45 to 50 kilopascal treatment has shown to actually maximize yield in the past. And then we're looking at a 30 kilopascal treatment, which we, you know, we thought going in this study about two years ago that that was optimal for corn, you know, kind of keeping it in the, the good middle of the road. Some other treatments we're looking at in this particular field is a smart irrigation scheduling app for corn. Um, I will state, and I just want to remind you on that app, it's in the beta test year two. And so it's not publicly available quite yet. The plan is to have it fully released and ready to go in 2022. And so when we talk about results here in a minute from the corn, you'll kind of see how it's performed, but overall it does a very good job. It works very similar to the Smart Irrigation Cotton and Smart Irrigation Soybean apps that are already available. So keep that in mind if you're interested in an app. Some of the other treatments we have out there is we have a scheduling tool and sensor by Valley. So that's Valley Irrigation Company that has that. We've installed it out in the field. We have Crop Metrics, Crop X sensor out in the field. That's also an all-in-one scheduling tool. We actually have two of their sensors installed in this field. Um, and then we're looking at the UGA checkbook method. And of course, we always hold a dry land plot out in the field to kind of compare to what our irrigation does and what it looks like. And then our last treatment is Irrigator Pro. And so we're using Irrigator Pro in combination with those soil water tension sensors and logging that, utilizing that data to help it make decisions. So I'm gonna talk about our corn results for just a minute and kind of what we've seen up till this year also. And so when we look at it, you know, I mentioned our different soil water tension thresholds. The 10 that we saw last year definitely way over irrigated that crop. We didn't see any yield reduction in the crop from that, but we put so much water out there that it really reduced our water use efficiency and profitability. We're just wasting a lot of money. Baseline is we're irrigating corn that much. We're wasting a lot of money on that crop and not seeing the returns back out of it. We move up to that 50 kilopascal one or the one I called dry earlier. It actually had one of our higher water use efficiencies and near one of our highest yields. Um, when we looked last year, just to give you a reference, our dry land plots had yields around 80 bushel per acre. That is pretty poor corn production in general. So that tells you last year was a hotter, drier year. Our irrigated plots had yields ranging from 210 to 220 bushels per acre. So that tells you there's a big response first to irrigation, and then there was some response within scheduling treatments within that. And so when we look at um, those treatments and where it stood, that 50 and that 30 were very similar to each other. The water use efficiency was actually higher on that 50 just a little bit. And so I would say if you're using soil water tension on corn, somewhere between 30 and 50 is a good optimal range to be in. Typically on a sandy loam soil like we have here, we recommend a 40 to 45 kilopascal trigger. And that's shown that that's about where we need to be on corn in that particular year. Irrigator Pro, um, as we talked about, is always a good option. That's a USDA uh, product that works in a couple of different ways, um, either as a soil water balance model or it works in a combination with sensors in a soil water balance model, which is how we use it. We enter our rainfall and our irrigation data into that manually. And we, at the time, we're currently entering our sensor data into it manually and letting it make a decision for us. Um, we talked about the Smart Irrigation Scheduling app. It's a soil water balance model that uses either the local weather station or uses gridded data networks and radar predictive rainfall to pull that in and then it tracks gr crop growth stage during the season and recommends when you should irrigate. It had one of our higher water use efficiencies last year and it seems to be doing very well this year. Um, and then some of the other treatments came out very well too. We're testing some of those commercially available treatments out there. If you've got more questions about those, you know, for sure feel free to reach out to myself or to reach out to your local county agent and we've got that information published um, in the corn reports from last year to talk about and we'll have it available this year once we get yield off of this study. So my big take home point from corn is um, you can irrigate, irrigate, irrigate corn. You really are not going to lose yield, but what you're going to lose is profitability from the perspective of the money it costs to one, run that irrigation system and move that water to the crop and the lack of return that you're going to get out of that extra water in the field. So we're not going to just keep seeing a yield bump for adding more and more irrigation to that crop. So when we're looking at scheduling methods on corn, it's really good to be on target, you know, to make sure we're not wasting money putting water out there that's not needed. So next, because it's a very similar study, I'm gonna move into cotton. So cotton, last year we ran a nine treatment study, uh, very similar to what that corn treatment you just heard was. This year we only had the availability for six treatments in that particular study. We're just now really starting to schedule irrigation good in cotton. We installed the sensors about three weeks ago. Um, 
Again, we're filming this at the end of June. I just want to throw that out there. It's going to air around July the 22nd. And so by that point, we're going to be moving into peak water use on cotton. We're talking about cotton water use when we see square and especially moving into bloom in that mid bloom, those that second or third week, all the way to about the sixth or seventh week of bloom, we're really going to see water use ramp up on cotton. And that's, that's when you're going to see this air. And so I want you to keep in mind when you're thinking about your cotton that time of year, you really need to stay on top of the water at that point. And what we see utilizing sensors at that time of year is we really start using the deep moisture in that July time frame. One, it's usually very hot. Two, it's usually kind of dry during that time. Three, we've put down a good thorough root structure. We've got a good big plant by that point, and it's in peak bloom most of the time. And so again, the water use is really going to ramp up at that time of year, and you want to stay on top of it. So if we want to talk about some of the scheduling treatments we have out in the cotton this particular year, we're testing two different um, soil water tensions, so similar to the corn, but we've got a um, kind of a drier treatment and kind of an optimal treatment out there. We're testing the valley scheduling system again. We've got Irrigator Pro. We've got the Smart Irrigation Cotton app. We've got the UGA checkbook. And then, of course, we've got a dry land that we do a, a check on. And so when we look at most of those, the, the big take-home point I want to push out there for cotton, what we usually end up seeing utilizing the checkbook or utilizing what I would call a very, very conservative method where we tend to over-irrigate that crop, we do see yield reductions in cotton. We've seen that. If you've ever seen any of the data I've shown during county meetings or any other times from 2013 all the way until 2020, we've had yield reductions for over-irrigating cotton. So if we're in a year that we're already getting a high amount of rainfall, you've got to really make sure that you're applying those irrigation events only when they're needed. If not, you can very rapidly cause yield reductions in that crop. So please keep that in mind when we're irrigating cotton, especially moving through the season. Um, when we look at it, one of our highest yielder, yielding treatments consistently is a 45 kilopascal treatment and what I usually do is weight those sensor depths. Here in cotton we've got them at 6, 12, and 18 inches deep. So you notice we're a little bit shallower than we were with corn and we're trying to reflect that root growth and pattern in cotton, you know, and where it's using water. I will weight those during the season, meaning that early season because we don't have roots down there, I probably don't use that 18 inch sensor yet. But as we move throughout the season, I'll put more and more weighting or more and more usage on that deeper sensor to reflect where we're using water from during that particular part of the season. So that's just something to kind of, you know, help you know how to manage irrigation and when to trigger a little bit better. So something to keep in mind on cotton. Um, a few other things is just to, just to track your information, you know, depending on whatever scheduling method you use. Because unlike what we talked about with corn just a few minutes ago, we will lose that yield potential. We've done talked about it. We will reduce yield for over-irrigating that crop. So it's really worth your time to make a time and potentially a monetary investment into an advanced irrigation scheduling method for cotton so we don't lose that yield potential. Um, the same thing you can see behind me, we've got a peanut field here. Same thing happens with peanuts. We've shown from 2014 all the way up to 2018, we can reduce yield potential over irrigating peanuts. So that's just another crop. We're not talking about that today. We're doing something a little bit different on peanuts, and I'm going to talk about that now. What we're looking at on them is each one of my treatments revolves around soil water tension sensor. And we've installed these at 4, 8, and 16 inches deep. You notice that's a little bit different. You think about what a peanut tap root looks like and where a lot of our small roots are at. That 4 inch sensor, that shallow one, is where we have a ton of our water use. But as it grows, it puts down a deep, deeper tap root. We need to make sure we're accounting for those deeper sensors also. So what we're doing out here is we're breaking the season into three parts. And that's based on physiological and vegetative growth stages. Zero to 40 days, 40 to 110, and 110 to 140. And during those different times of the season, we're looking at either keeping the soil drier, keeping the soil wetter, or keeping it what we've termed as optimal. And we've shown since, again, go back to the first year I did peanut studies down here with sensors, 2014, that a 45 kilopascal trigger the entire season has maximized yields. And so that's why we started looking at adjusting the soil moisture, adjusting that trigger level within season. This is a combined study that um, I've got Dr. Chris Pallon and Dr. Bob Kimmerite working on it with me, and we're monitoring some physiological responses to those different soil moistures or different treatment thresholds during the season. And we're also looking at, are we helping to alleviate or cause more alpha toxin problems in this crop by holding the soil moisture differently in that last part of the season? We had some promising results from 2020, and we're hoping to carry some of that through through 2021 and, and collect a little bit more data on it. So peanuts, we're not just looking at scheduling, but we're looking again, I want to reiterate, we're looking at different soil moistures during 
critical growth stages to see if we can promote better growth at certain times of year, if we can promote better yield at certain times of year, if we can reduce uh, instances of alpha toxin at the end of the season by controlling our irrigation better, et cetera. And so that's why we've got those combinations of treatments out there. And then of course in this field, we always have a dry land check too that we can look back to. So that's the three studies I have going this year at the Irrigation Research Park here down near Camilla at Stripling Park. So I, I appreciate all the support from the staff here. They, they do put up with a lot for me requiring irrigation almost on a daily basis on some of those treatments. Um, they do a very good job handling. I wanna commend them for you know, what they've been able to do and putting this field today together and everything else. And if you got any more questions for me, of course, feel free to reach out. Reach out to your local county agent for any of the information you've heard today or any irrigation scheduling information or questions you may have, you know, during the season. So now's really the time, especially on your peanuts and your cotton in mid-July, that we look at peak water use. So keep that in mind and make sure you stay on top of your water, uh, water requirements and irrigation scheduling so that we can do the best we can with our crop. Again, appreciate your attention today and attending the field day.